two, one. We're live. Welcome um, everybody back here to Siegel Talks at the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center, CUNY City University in Manhattan. And uh, it's for us week 14 um, of, of our series where we talk to theater artists and thinkers and curators from around the world, but also from the Americas um, to find out what is going on in, in their minds and how are they experiencing this. Unprecedented time of Corona, the time of civil unrest uh, on the streets, the time where uh, killings uh, happen and uh, demonstrations up there, statues are tumbling. And uh, it is a time where um, we all look deep inside ourselves and try to find uh, out what is essential, who are we, where are we going to, and where are we coming from. It's a hard time, it's a devastating time for so many officially over 46 million Americans registered for unemployment. I think it's down registered now to under 20 million, but still uh, it's uh, shocking the developments and in America where health insurance is so closely tied to your, to your job. You lose your health insurance when you don't have a job. Unthinkable in all other industrial nations. Um, it is a, a truly a, a time of, of danger, of health risk for all communities, but especially those who have been on the fringes, who have been disenfranchised mm -hmm. for um, mm -hmm. such a long, long time. And um, we uh, don't know what will happen. It might be a summer of unrest. We have a government we don't trust. We have workplaces we don't trust. Temperatures are rising uh, outside in the streets. Uh, we are confined in small spaces. And uh, after two or three months, um, we all, uh, you as human beings, react uh, and uh, differently uh, to things. So um, what will this all be in the middle of this? Uh, we are, uh, have our artists with us today. We have Ebony Noel Golden from New York City and Kami. Um, Ilnezanmi, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about them later on. Thank you so much for, for, for joining us, but let me make a few very brief remarks. Uh, we now have worldwide over 10 million infections. People think it's 10 times higher, though there are 100 million cases, most probably 2.6 uh, uh, million infections in the US and 130,000 people have died. Half a million people died globally. It's unprecedented numbers. and. Uh, and in states in the U.S., which is doing so terribly, by, uh, it's led so terribly and not prepared at all over all these decades, states, states like Texas, Florida, and Arizona um, are experiencing um, such uh, terrible outbreaks. Even Pence all of a sudden now wears a mask and says masks are important. And, um, and we're getting more and more information about the virus, people now developing hallucinations when they have the have uh, the, um, uh, the virus and uh, also it comes back. It now looks like immunity might only last three or four months. Um, more and more young people are showing up also in hospitals. Not only they are the ones who are spreading them, it's things half of the people are between 22 and 40. And um, so um, we all don't know what, what will happen. Uh, US company Gilead uh, now published today the price for um, antiviral drug. Uh, remdesivir, it's, they say it's between $2,300 and $3,100 for a five-day cure. Um, it's an already existing drugs. Uh, economists say because it already exists, it costs actually $5 for a pill. Mm -hmm. So it's shocking also, I think, uh, in the face of that crisis that we have, that the system uh, is charging thousands and thousands of dollars saying, oh, we prevent so much more damage because if people would get really sick, it would cost more. Uh, it just also shows what is, is so wrong. Um, Broadway, as we know, went dark on March 12th and just mm -hmm. decided uh, today, announced that it will stay dark to the rest of the year, most probably to early spring. That means all of New York City's theater artists, technicians, light designers, sound designers, ushers are out of work. It's devastating. And um, we do not really know where this will go. We don't see Broadway theaters, by the way, doing the work what Ebony and Kemi are doing. They don't produce masks. They don't engage with their neighborhoods. They just close down and wait till they can make money again. We all love Broadway and they're a great source of employment and what they do. But uh, where's the social conscious of that uh, 
great industry in New York City with five, six billion, I think, revenue a year. I don't know exactly the numbers. Uh, European Union uh, will close still its borders. It will open for 12, 14 states, which have a very good record. The United States will not be in it. Americans will not be able to visit because of the disastrous politics here that led to such high infections. Um, I think only 16 infections per 100,000 people is okay for the European Union. And Trump closed them down when he had when just you know 800 or 1,000 infections in the US without talking to anybody overnight. And I think the US now as a, a, a retaliation or whatever is perhaps also on the list, but maybe for good reasons. The US is 60 a day up to 100 per 100,000 people. So it is uh, almost 60, 70, 600, 700% higher than a safe number. A thousand, thousands of people are still infected in Africa every, every day. Brazil, uh, in Iran, the numbers are, are terrible. Um, India is producing a hospital out of cardboard with 10,000 beds. They don't really know um, what to do. And if we come to New York City, are we going to talk today about New York City with these two great artists and community organizers, curators, and cultural producers? Um, New York City is look, looking for its soul. There was a Spiegel magazine report about it. New York is opening slowly. Uh, last Monday, 300,000 people went back to work. Businesses, bars, barbershops reopened. About 5,000 restaurants. And um, they stuck to the playbook, New York City, uh, compared to Florida and Texas, and it's working out last Thursday. There were only 18 infections in New York City. It was 1,200 in the high days of it, so it went down to 18. But still, it's a devastating moment for the city we all love. Uh, the New York City Marathon is canceled. Uh, 66 million tourists came last year. How many will really come? Uh, and will New York City really be... Um, what uh, what it was and um and the soul of new york city when it comes to what makes this city so different so exciting so great it's highly connected to ebony and cami uh, in their work um cami who worked at the workers art center and uh, is part of the great laundromat project uh, which says it's uh, uh, taking change being an agent of change in your own community to have a joyful justice to make art, build community, create change in Harlem, in the South Bronx, and in Bed-Stuy, a project there, trying to shifting the world into a better place. It was created by Risa Wilson and together community to organize it and to write its own, uh, own history. It's a brilliant organization, up to a million dollars, if I understand right, they have distributed for creative arts project that really create help and create the community. And, um, and we wonder well, how they are doing now. And uh, Ebony, who is uh, here with us, she's an artist, a scholar, and a cultural strategist, originally from Texas, which is hit mm -hmm. so hard. And I hope your family yeah. and friends um, are safe. She is in Harlem and she creates site-specific ceremonies, live art installations, creative collaborations, and arts experiments that explore the radically image uh, and uh, visible strategies for collective black um, liberation. And she founded uh, Betty's Daughters Arts Collaborative and uh, also the Jupiter Performance Studio, uh, which serves as a hub for uh, the study of diasporic black performance tradition. So both of them in a way are very close um, to what we do. And we need uh, some input, some help, some ideas. And I think both of you found something, also something that's very New York. So I apologize for my lengthy introduction, but uh, it's a Monday and I think it's good to yeah. give an update also to the readers of the world. So both of you, um, thank you. And since I see that, Kemi, you have your microphone on, Ebony, not Kemi. How are you and where are you at the moment? Good afternoon to you and to Ebony. Thank you so much for joining and to everyone listening. Um, so I'm Kemi. And I am uh, tuning in from Lenape and Canarsie land, uh, now known as Flatbush in Brooklyn. Um, I'm on the sixth floor of uh, my, my apartment building. Um, and I can hear birds, which is a beautiful thing this afternoon. And to your point, yes, I, um, I'm the executive director of the Laundromat Project. And we make our art, we build community, and we create change, all things that we're still able to do in this moment. And in fact, 
becomes even more important to do, but also to figure out how to do it in new ways, uh, particularly without being able to be in live physical space with one another has definitely been an, uh, an interesting challenge to, to navigate. And we are a black rooted organization founded by a black woman, majority black board run by a black woman in this case. Um, and we're POC centered. So we really are interested in the spectrum of people of color and um, their contributions to this incredible city and to the cultural sphere of this city. And um, one of the first things we did when COVID um, became a reality for all of us was to really turn to our artists and ask, how are you doing? What are you doing? What's going on? Um, and like we've heard from so many uh, others, um, surveys, et cetera, they had all, you know, uh, most people's economic uh, livelihoods were deeply affected in this moment. Um, and many of them had precarious gig economy type jobs, be it a teaching artist or, or some other um, kind of gig. Many of them were uh, laid off. People have, um, those who've stayed in the city um, have, you know, struggled to do so as either they and or roommates have, you know, lost jobs, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that's a real, real, real reality. Um, our staff is majority people of color. Um, 10 of the 12, and that's including two interns. Um, and people's families have been deeply affected by this. Um, and particularly folks of color in this city, right? So we, it, it maps to the statistics in that way. Um, so we all know people who have been affected. Um, and in some cases, um, uh, at least for me, a couple of layers out, not my immediate family, but I do know people who've passed away. So it's been an incredibly um, challenging time to hold space as a community of folks for the staff and as a community of folks for the LP, which that build community part of our mission is really central to the way we do work. And some of the ways that we've sought to respond is to keep doing the work and to do it more deeply and to ask questions and to listen and to be in community, um, be it digital. So our fellowship program moved online. We worked with our, we work with about 10 artists who want to learn how to do this work more deeply. They all engage quite deeply with uh, Ebony, who is our uh, cultural organizing consultant and has done that work with us for uh, seven, uh, since 2013 or 2012, actually, 2012. Um, we also worked with our uh, artists and residents to pivot their projects, all of which are in process in really beautiful and deep ways. And I can talk about that later if it makes sense. And lastly, we just for this moment, we um, started a creative action fund. So many commissions to artists to create work in this moment and really recognizing um, that what we could do and the gift we felt we could give and the way we could show up in this moment was to actually acknowledge and value the folks in our community as creators. So we had an incredible Ramadan concert by, uh, at the end of Ramadan by Zayn Alan. We've had beautiful meditation pieces by Bianca Monet. Today we have uh, Terence Trio is um, debuting an online exhibition called The Language of Intimacy, again, very much focused in this moment. That was actually not a requirement. They did not have to respond to COVID, but many of them did because it was artists respond to life and respond to the moment and get, show us ourselves, right? So they kind of stepped up into that moment. So we were able to support 27 artists across 22 projects and that's one of the things I'm most proud of in this moment is being able to show up for our artists in that way and continuing to be in co deep conversation with our staff about how to show up for them. And we've thought a variety of ways to do that. We've been able to keep our full staff at full pay for this mm -hmm. entire period and for C being able to do that through the end of the year. So I'll stop there. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Frank and Kimmy. Um, I am in the neighborhood of Harlem, situated on traditional Lenin Lenape land, and um, I've been um, in New York for about 13 years. Um, I'm very grateful to be able to say that I'm doing well. I'm doing well. 
Um, I took the, the, the call to stay home very seriously and I've done that and I'm doing that and um, I'm listening to myself and listening mm. to um, my, my body, my spirit and my community in, in terms of um, what I should be doing and how I can be a help and um, a collaborator with folks who I'm accountable to. Um, and so my work, um, in a lot of ways, because it's so community rooted and community is always different every day, um, I find that from moment to moment, I am having to navigate the changes in, in what's happening in community. And that, I think, has always been the case. And in this moment, um, I'm learning very deeply about the muscle that I have um, mm -hmm. developed, if you will, to be able to say, okay, there is a rupture happening here and what? Um, mm -hmm. I would venture to say, and I'm, I'm sure this has been said multiple times in multiple venues, that yes, there are ruptures happening now and there have been ruptures happening in the past and there will be ruptures happening in the future. And the reality is this, in my, in my mind and in my sensibility is that um, the people who decide how they will gather, whether that's virtually, the people who decide what needs to happen in terms of rapid response, whether that's mutual aid or rapidly getting artists um, um, money to make work or continue making their work, whatever it is, these are, I would dare say, ancient practices um, that some of us have had to lean into or lean on, but for, for others of us, it's a standard. It is a standard. And so I think this moment um, for me personally and for the work that I am called to do is a moment of, of breakthrough, of understanding that I, the way that some of us work, the way that we uh, make art, make theater, make community, make change, is authentic to where we come from and authentic to who we are. And it's never been wrong. It's actually been the best strategy. And sometimes that strategy isn't what's lifted up as the best. Sometimes it's not the shiniest. Sometimes you can't explain it, you know, but it is what people are going back to in a lot of ways. It's kind of like, okay, folks need food. Who has food? Get the food to the people. Um, and it's not a lot of paperwork or, you know, back and forth. It really is what do people need? Who has, who, where are the resources? Get the resources to the people. And it's interesting because in this moment, you know, um, actually right now, um, I am on the precipice as a, as a, as a, as an artist on so many things, right? I'm celebrating a year anniversary of a large processional work that happened in partnership with the National Black Theater and a year ago. And I'm on the precipice of making new work here in Harlem, but also in Weeksville um, or in, in central Brooklyn. And um, there are a lot of expectations when you are an independent artist, when you've been commissioned, if you will, to make a work. And these commissions are, are supposed to happen, you know, that's the expectation. And I think there's been something that has, has evolved and emerged for everyone in our field around humanity, around what it means to produce and to make theater and to make work that is rooted in a community ethic. And it's, you know, rooted in people being whole and human and not being producers of products and, you know, for others' consumption. And so, you know, when all, when everything, when this rupture happened, um, I knew that I was, I would have, I would have to respond in some way, but I knew I didn't have to respond immediately. So I just sat down. <laughs> I sat down. And, um, and that is also because, you know, I run, a company, a business that is also needs to be in rhythm with arts and culture communities and organizations. If my clients or collaborators are not ready to move, then who am I to say move? Who am I to say have the meeting? Who am I to say let's make a rehearsal, right? And so all of this listening, 
all of this waiting and being patient and being responsive and not reactionary is what I, I mean, I think I would want to do it that way, even, even though um, it, was, it was challenging. I don't actually don't, but I actually don't know any other way to do it, right? Um, and so what this time for me has been about and I know theaters happen in buildings. I know theater happens in buildings, dance happens in buildings. But for, for me and for the folks I'm collaborating with, this has been a very, um, a beautiful breakthrough because I'm able to collaborate with people who I would not be able to get to New York. My collaborators on the works that I'm building right now are literally all over the world. And they, we figure out the time zone difference and we get on this, this, this interweb and we do the things. And I am reminded, and I will, I will say it as often as possible, as loud as possible, that theater is about people. Theater is about storytelling. Theater happened before buildings existed in, in regards to, you know, you must make theater inside a, a structure. We all know that. But there's an economy around that, that actually goes against you know a capitalist framework so what are my friends doing what are we doing we're making theater and dance in our living rooms we're making theater and dance in our in our parks we're making theater and dance on on the in the virtual space and what i am learning um i just had a, a virtual um salon yesterday an open studio of sorts that is um, show, showed some deep listening that I've been doing around a project that I'm building. And what I'm learning in this very real current moment is that as long as we people are here, theater will happen. Well, it will happen. And if the theater needs to be on Zoom, then we will Zoom the theater. We will do it. We are, we are resilient, but we're also creative, that we're artists. We always are finding a way to do the most with the most or the most with the least and anything in between. And so I'm, I'll, I, will, I will go back to what I was saying at the beginning of my, my check-in. Um, my goodness, I'm doing well because, because the people I'm collaborating with did not give up. We, were, we rested, we waited, we were afraid, but we did not give up. And in that not giving up, the people who have the coins to support our independent processional theater, they did not give up. So what are we doing? We're figuring it out as we go. We're making the road as we walk it. I think that's the saying. And flying the plane while building it. And, um, but isn't that always where production starts? We never know. I mean, I never know how it's all gonna come together, but I definitely think leaning into the challenge and the, the uncertainty, um, and building a practice that is in relationship to that is where I am and where my community is. And we are making some of, I'll, I'll have to say, I'll say this and then I'll move back. I'm actually so excited about this work we're making. <laughs> we're not rushing into the studio. We're not burning resources. Every penny is accounted for in a very significant way. Every penny I, you know, when I'm, I'm, the, I'm the kind of intermediary between the commission, you know, commissioning organizations and the people who are making the work. And I know that that money is going to pay someone's rent, to make sure someone's child can eat, to make sure someone can make their own art. And th that, you know, in this moment, I'm, I feel like the art, is a conduit for people being able to live fully and to live with dignity. Um, and whether it was this moment or some other moment, I would want that to be the case for my role in, um, in practice. Mm -hmm. I hear that so deeply, if you don't, uh, uh, Ebony, because it does feel like my instinct certainly as a person, but also the, the instinct of uh, the LP, the laundromat as an organism, right? Um, was to lean more deeply into the work because we had been doing the work. Um, so once we realized it was a matter of shifting tools, 
not the work, but just like, oh, we'll have, we won't be meeting at the new school to, you know, or downtown arts or, or wherever, we're gonna be meeting on Zoom, but we're still gonna be in community, do the work, lean on one another, make space because it was and continues to be a really difficult time. So to allow grace uh, for each other, um, to allow space for each other to, to shift and pivot and, and step back and step, uh, uh, you know, move back, move forward, et cetera. It was leaning more deeply into ourselves rather than making any significant shifts. And one of the things that I felt so deeply in this moment um, that became clear for each of us, whether we wanted it to or not, um, particularly as arts institutions, was our deepest values were immediately on display based on how we reacted and who we thought needed to carry the weight of the moment. Um, so Ebony, thank you for continuing to just talk about people. And our recognition was really clear that we were talking about specific people that we could name. We could name their children. We could name their mom at home that they take, grandma they're taking care of, et cetera. So we couldn't start a conversation with from a place of scarcity and loss. We could be afraid, but we did have to keep going forward and to figure it out and to do it in a way that centered people and needs, emotional, uh, psychic, um, economic, social, et cetera and to lead from there and to lead with always with the idea of people it was never abstract who we were talking about, be it our artists or our staff or our board or our community members. There was literally just no abstraction to hide from uh, or to hide within. And it wasn't our instinct to do it anyway, but, um, but it also just, I don't even know how we would have navigated this uh, in abstraction as opposed to very specific folks. And uh, recognizing that culture only had a more um, important role to play in this moment and that people wanted to turn to, to their creative mojo um, as one of the assets and one of the healing tools and one of the uh, justice and liberation tools that they had at their disposal and had had for generations. So being able to lean more deeply into ourselves and the real thing has been other folks recognizing their lack of muscle in that area and hopefully the need to build that muscle and that's been the certainly the invitation the demand the admonishment um etc over the last few weeks as for those who didn't have that muscle and needed to build it out more the 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 demand has been well now is the time there's there's no time to dally um and that's been an interesting um uh thing to witness and also to be navigating ourselves from a very different place. So what, what does New York City mean for both of you? What needs to change? Oh my goodness, Frank, that is a huge Ooh. question. <laughs> what needs to change? Okay, well, I'll, I'll start, but this could be a litany, right? And I won't, I won't go into a litany, but I'll just talk about from the perspective that, you know, Kimmy and I are mentioning about what does it mean to live in a people-centered city? What do human beings need to thrive, not just survive, but to thrive? And we know these things, right? We know these things and we know the, the socioeconomic and the political reasons why some people are doing just fine in this moment and some are not. So what do we need? We need universal health care. What do we need? We need affordable housing. What do we need? We need, we need schools that are equitable and you know, prepare young ones to live their best lives in the present and into the future. Um, what do we need? We need a food system that, that doesn't work against our holistic well-being. Uh, what do we need? We need spaces where we can um, express the fullest capacity of our lives creatively. You know, um, we need um, a city, a New York City that, um, that is actively working to um, stop the killings of black trans women. <laughs> we, 
we what do, we need a lot of things. We need a lot of things. And I mean, I, I could go on and on, but um, you know, New York City, it's tough. It, this is a tough place. And um, it's also a place where d- people come to dream mm-hmm. and to vision and to, you know, to be something they could be in any other place in the world, you know? And I do think we need vision. We need space to dream. We need um, space to fulfill our dreams, not just dream, but then be able to activate those dreams. Um, yeah, I, I, think, I think these things that we need are not just about what New York City needs, but it is what New York City needs too. Um, we also, you know, we need to pay artists more. We, you know, there's a, there's a whole litany, a whole road I can go down around what people get paid. And there's a lot of, 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 of in our, in our industry of theater in particular and dance, a lot of folks are pushing for visibility and transparency around pay. Um, And that is, that is really a big deal right now, you know? And, um, and so, I mean, yeah. Yes. Um, Kimmy, what does New York City need? (laughs) You covered a large swath of it. (laughs) And I really appreciate you for that. Um, Because in the end, it needs to be a city where people um, can stay, can thrive, can be the best version of themselves. And particularly our Black, Indigenous, and other folks of color. Um, to one of the many things, and we know this now, that um, uh, COVID uh, made clear to others, um, to all of us, including those of us who had the privilege of not having to know this previously, was how much we're actually dependent on people of color and how much we're dependent on low-income folks and how much we're dependent on each other to keep this city going. And if we really value that, as we have learned, we should and need to value in this moment, how do we respond to that now? And how do we respond to that when COVID is over? Um, To your point around issues of pay, um, how do we, create housing that allows people to live here with dignity? How do we take care of transit? The number one question anyone has about reopening is like, how am I gonna get to work? New York, it's, it's not unusual to have a 45 minute to an hour, hour and a half commute one way. Uh, mm. Speaking as someone who had one of those uh, 75 minute commutes. Um, that's a really long distance to go and to be worried about it the entire 75 minute distance and to have to go or to be forced to go. One of the things I discovered in this moment, I I do know how to ride a bike, I like to say. Um, However, I have never ridden it on a city street. Um, But in this moment, like everybody else, I'm like trying to figure out what are some of the options. Well, I live in a neighborhood that doesn't have city bike. And most of my staff live in neighbors that do not have city bike, which is our bike share program that was brought on by um, in the Bloomberg era and very deeply from the beginning, uh, not equitably distributed in the city was not treated as a public resource. It was treated as a special resource. Um, And special resources of that nature don't make it into black and POC and indigenous communities in this city. Um, and just as a very practical example, like that's, unless I decide to buy a bike and my staff members decide to buy a bike, we actually can't use that in this time. when that would be a really incredible thing to have at our disposal to be able, I only work three miles from the, um, LP's, uh, future space in, in central Brooklyn, three miles. That's not far. Mm-hmm. I would learn how to, I figured out how to navigate a city street, uh, for three miles, but I, I can't do it through the, the. Uh, asset that is meant to be a citywide asset for everyone. So those kinds of fissures and the ways that we decide who deserves the commons, who gets to participate in public goods, things that are ostensibly meant to be public goods, but that really aren't, universal health care, um, et cetera, these things being tied to jobs. Well, most, so many of us in New York, and particularly along income and um, 
racial lines um, are tied to jobs that don't have health care or um, that have very precariously placed health care. So again, if you were furloughed or lost your job right away, that's no longer something that's accessible to you. So that sense of precarity being built in is the thing that needs to disappear. There's so much freedom that I can imagine for us on the other side of universal uh, health care, equitable uh, transit, um, affordable housing, um, schooling that does not treat us um, as disposable and as criminals if you're you know, in a high school, um, uh, mm -hmm. the wrong high school in New York City, or if you go to our public universities are an incredible, beautiful asset, CUNY and SUNY systems, but they are so incredibly under-resourced yeah. and they're the most diverse uh, entities, and you know this, right, yeah, yeah. Um, in this city. And it seems like the more diverse you are, the less access you have to resources. So if we could flip that, we would be very much on our way um, to, a, to a city that allows folks to thrive. And cultural workers are part of the world, right? So that's something that we're not separate. Working class folks and, and cultural workers have a lot in common uh, when it comes to all of these issues. Um, and we have uh, education bills to go with it. School loans. <laughs> oh my goodness. Can we talk about abolishing school loans? Uh, <laughs> I think when- Yes, 100%. You know, indeed, indeed. Um, I think, you know, I'm just, as I listen to Kimmy, we, you know, this has been coming, this has been said a lot over the course of this, you know, this time of rupture and breakthrough. Um, we just need to burn up what the old, the old normal was and, and start to really lean into vision about what, what do we, what, how do we want to live, you know? Mm -hmm. And I know that this isn't a simple, I'm saying it as if like, yeah, let's not, not do that and now do this. I know it's not easy, but if, if I'm going to be in righteous struggle around how to live in this city and frankly, anywhere in the world. I want to do so in a way that is deeply, deeply thinking about what people need to thrive. You know, I'm not saying it's easy. You know, there's a whole, in this moment, there are a lot of people, you know, saying very vocally, we need to abolish the police system. We need, you know, how do we go from that to not having police? I don't have that in my, in my body as a, as a response, but a lot of people are figuring out how to reduce harm in communities, how to increase care in communities, how to reconfigure, because we know, you know, that we can, if, yeah. if we want to, if we really want to, if we want to think about how to really build whole, safe, caring, loving communities, that is a righteous struggle that I would like to be in. And I feel mm -hmm. like in some ways, you know, that is tied to everything that I do. Um, and I would like it to be even more rigorously tied to everything that I do. Yeah. Um, since, since we, both of you also, and we, you know, work in the theater and performance world, and one could say theater began with the Greeks, and it showed that there was fate and you couldn't escape. There were the gods, things were decided, this is what's going to happen. It was not in your hand, often even Christian beliefs were in a way like this. Then slowly, you know, through Moliere and others, the individual came out, the servant was on the middle of the stage after the kings in Shakespeare were on the stages. And individual voices came up and said, no, what I think is of significance. And then there were realism, you reported the world as it is. Um, uh, and, uh, and then slowly it was Brecht and others said, well, it's no longer enough to portrait the world as it is. Milo Routh had this on the program we have to actually change it. So, um, and the next step in a way is, you know, a, Brecht, a call for, for action. Brecht had Mother Courage, where he said, just look what she did. And then you make up your own mind. You know, it doesn't work what she's doing, be better. But the next step, and I say both of you are part of that new world or of the future of it. The next step in a way is to engage with the community, with the people, and they are in the center. Of it. There's the German company Rimini Protocol that also works in that way with the experts of the everyday or 
the documentary theater movement where you interview people. So what you guys do is actually say, no, I'm not the writer who wants to have his play, the director, you say, let's look at community. How do we empower people? They are in the center. I saw the projects, the LP puts together, people who have ideas, you support them and you connect. And many people around the world say, of all our talks, whether it's Indonesia or Belgium, whether it was South Africa, or whether it was Hong Kong, they say this is now at the center. And what you guys do, I think, is actually part of anticipating a future where the, even the artist is perhaps no longer as much known. People said, Kemi did it all, Ebony, but, but these people are, the people of the neighbors are in there. What is missing, as you also said, from the Broadway world, do they engage with Midtown? Do they do projects with the people who live there who are in the meatpacking district or uh, Hell's Kitchen? I don't think so. And support the small theaters of the round. So tell us a bit about what you felt in that community. Why do you do that and what works? What could people, also listeners from other countries, what could they learn? What do you do? Why do you do it and what works? Um, I'll uh, jump. Mm -hmm. Cammie, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so we think of ourselves always as part of a larger community. So I was referring to people earlier and art workers are, you know, very connected to working class folks and people engaged in various kinds of struggle um, that af affects their lives also as art workers. And for the uh, Laundromat Project as an institution, um, as a black and POC institution, it's similar for us. We really think about this as how are we engaged within a collective community? How can we do work and, and support other organizations and or uh, art workers in a way that says, if it's good for me, if it's gonna be good for me, it has to be good for you too, right? Like that sense of mm -hmm. we're in this together um, mm -hmm. is very central to our work and our ethos. And a lot of that comes from listening deeply, um, from being present um, in the sense of you can't know if you're not there, right? Um, and in, that, in this moment, there looks different than it might have looked six months ago again, which would have been very physically based. Um, but checking in, talking, going to town halls, uh, looking at social media and where people are, listening to reading and listening to ancestors as well as, you know, trying to be the ancestors we want to be for somebody else. Um, that sense of um, time being very circular and that sense of uh, when we're we don't get, one, one of us does not get to thrive unless all of us are thriving. Uh, something that Ebony said earlier that really um, uh, spoke to me is this idea that so much, uh, 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 and that you were also just saying, Frank, this idea that so much of what we already know to do, or so much of what we're discovering needs to be done right now has already been done by a lot of different communities who have to do it. And or, and I'm again talking about smaller uh, arts organizations, community-based arts organization, BIPOC organizations, and the people within them that make them thrive. So Black, Indigenous, and POC communities have had to depend on one another, have had to um, thrive as a group of folks um, because there was no way to kind of do that alone uh, for long. Um, and uh, being, being in a moment when that kind of way of approaching the work and the doing and the being, um, how to be in the world, um, uh, and having that lifted up in this moment as, as one of the possibilities, it's kind of like it's already there. One of the artists we have worked with is uh, Lizania Cruz, and she, on her Instagram, over the, every, every uh, week or so, she posts like things that she posted last week. She posted like, here are ways that we hold up care already. These are the ways that we already practice being in a community of care. So to the example of like, what do we do? It, what would this city look like? What would society look like if we, if we centered people and care and the care of people? Um, she kind of started pointing out, this is what already exists. 
here's how mutual aid societies are working, here's how artists are supporting one another, here are SUSUs, which is, you know, people putting money together to be able to, to um, fund their big dreams. Here's how this sense of being in community as a verb, community as something that's active, something that you do, already exists in so many communities. And it's about saying, it, we already value this, how, how can we lift up what's already happening and say, this is something you could do too, whoever the you is, mm -hmm. um, and be valued when we're asked to teach the work in a more active way to be valued by, you know, being paid and having that be valued and seen and not just taken, right? So how do we um, uh, do this in a non-extractive way? Because we're already doing it and have been doing it and hold ourselves in deep legacy. One of the things I would love Ebony to talk about, because I feel like there's something I've really learned from her, is the sense of how legacy functions, um, how that sense of ancestral being a continuing plane. And, um, and we think about that organizationally from every, anyone from, you know, the Harlem uh, uh, Renaissance, but also the Studio Museum and the Black Arts Movement and Phyllis Wheatley and, and a lot of the people who are part of the LP come from all over the globe. I, I'm Nigerian, American, except we're pulling on a lot of different traditions and that sense of being grounded um, is also really important. Yeah. Um, Ebony, Ebony, could you talk about legacy? No, before we just maybe uh, yes, one sorry. question. Can, could you give one or two or three examples of projects where you say these were mm. the ones we commissioned and they stand for this for our viewers, our listeners? What are what are laundromat probably say this actually exemplifies yes. specifically what we do? Yes. What theaters could learn all around the world, say, because they could do the same. They could have a cami in as part of their staff. And then Ebony, I would Absolutely. love to hear of your so ongoing I'll, I'll project, but yeah, maybe some. Project. Absolutely, I'll give you one because I know time oh, is of the essence. Mm -hmm. So Meal to Heal is a project that we're supporting right now. Um, and it is by two artists who are Filipino American, Xenia Diente and Jacqueline uh, Reyes. Um, and just as an example of caring, Xenia had been an uh, artist uh, fellow in 2012, and we support a lot of our artists over and over again in new ways and forms. We stick with them over time as opposed to just being a one-time thing. And, you know, in theater, that might be, you know, people tend to, you know, maybe commission a project or, you know, different plays over years, right? So that same ethos of, of we value you, we think there's something beautiful here, and we wanna go on a journey with you as a creative person. So Xenia uh, came back at, at, at this year and um, became one of our artists in residence and brought along Jacqueline, who had been a volunteer in the past with the LP. And they were interested in uh, partnering with small businesses, um, Filipino businesses in Woodside, um, and other parts of that part of Queens, Elmer's Woodside, Jack, uh, Jackson Heights, but there's a particular part of Woodside that is known as Little Manila. Um, and so very much a, a hub of Filipino uh, businesses. And this is a neighborhood that has uh, tens of thousands of Filipino Americans. It is, uh, Xenia herself grew up in this neighborhood. And they were planning to build a series of partnerships with small businesses and artists leading up to Filipino American month in October when they would do a festival. Well, COVID landed and literally before the end of March. So our last day in the office was March 9th. And before the end of March, they had already figured out a pivot for their project, um, partially grounded in the fact that like so many uh, uh, Filipino families, um, they could each trace, including their mothers, women working as nurses in this country because there's actually been a structured pipeline of Filipino women coming to the United States to be nurses and, and all of the econ e economics that might imply, right, about what they're doing to care for their families back in um, the Philippines as well as the communities they've built right here. So they immediately uh, got in contact with um, the Filipino, a Filipino American um, organization. NAFCON is the, is the uh, acronym, I don't remember all the words. Um, and 
started saying, let's look, and they were in that part of um, Queens again, Elmer's Hospital is right down the street from where Xenia lives. And we all know almost, uh, those of us in New York and elsewhere probably know that Elmer's, Elmhurst Hospital emerged very early on in COVID as a kind of emblem um, because people were dying there and et cetera. Like, um, so they were right down the street. And, one, and knowing that there were a number of Filipino Americans working at the hospital, as well as neighborhood nursing homes, other uh, community care centers. So also knowing that the Filipino American businesses that they had planned to partner with suddenly had no business or severely reduced business. So they immediately set up a GoFundMe to raise money. Then they took that money, paid it to a variety of Filipino American businesses, particularly restaurants in Little Manila area. They took those meals once a week and fed them to Filipino American um, health workers and whoever else was in their unit. But they did research to see which nursing homes or particular units had high um, numbers of Filipino health workers, um, be they nurses and orderlies, doctors, etc. Took these incredible meals and gave them to the health workers who were working so hard in the middle of this pandemic. And this was April when we were peaking. Yep. Um, and fed them once a week as a way of saying thank you. In the meantime, Jacqueline, who's an incredible graphic designer and actually works for the United Nations, um, she designed a beautiful mural and was able to install it just two weeks ago outside one of these restaurants. She painted it in her bedroom, uh, 24 feet. <laughs> Not, it, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a really big one. It's the, it is the first Filipino mural in the neighborhood that is known for its Filipino businesses and residents, but they've never been able to do this. And mm -hmm. apparently from reading news articles and talking to them, there had been conversation about this forever, but now there's this permanent mural outside this restaurant that wishes you welcome in Tagalog, right? So that's, that's a way that was about centering people, centering care, bringing in art, bringing in culture, bringing in the tools that artists had around community care and setting up essentially a mutual aid system that fed itself. They are continuing to partner with small businesses and artists, and they're still working towards um, a, a variety of projects and things that will be part of the Filipino American History Month in October. But they were able to still take this project and move it around in the way that this moment needed it to move um, in response. So that's one example. Ebony, you have tons. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I want to make sure I'm, I'm responding to the question, like what are some ways in which, um, can you repeat the question, Frank? I want to make sure I'm clear. Well, your, your work, which I see as artwork, curatorial work, you know, first of all, your project where you say you were so excited about mm -hmm. at the moment, I would like to hear more about, but why do you do it? And what works best in your long experience for over 10, 15 years working in it for all, for everybody who's looking at how can we do that? How, can, what advice do you have? And um, mm -hmm. so give some examples. Because people yeah. don't know, haven't done, they think we produce a play by a playwright and then you come and pay money and you go home, sure. which is great. And I, theater and performance is a big house, as Hans Lehmann said, but it has many rooms. Mm -hmm. This is one, but you are opening a new patio. You are opening a new edition. So I want to know from you, what do you do? What works? What, yeah, what and I, would, I will say that what I'm doing isn't new. To Kimmy's point, I'm in a tradition of making work that is ancient. Mm -hmm. And um, and I I heard I heard your kind of trajectory and lineage of theater, and I I come from a, a whole different school of thought and practice where theater mm -hmm. is ceremony and theater is ritual, and you know theater is everyday life, and sometimes we put that on stage, but it it happens every day. So there is a deep sense of storytelling and what stories are used for to tell the news to talk about how people got to where they are, to talk about how people have changed and to talk about people's connection to the land and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And that's an ancient practice. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, you mentioned Broadway um, and Broadway is not my default. I think Broadway has its place 
and a space and a lot of you know stories that are told there we need to hear and that's not my default so there is a way in which you think about the intersection of culture institution and theater company or whatever and that is for me coming through places like the ensemble theater in houston texas um, the national black theater here in harlem Billy Holiday Theater in Brooklyn, and I could go on and on. Mm -hmm. So there is, I think, rooted in um, um, uh, uh, diasporic Black aesthetic or diasporic African aesthetic, this idea that theater is supposed to do something. Theater is supposed to do something beyond the show. And um, there is a, there are a whole, uh, you know, I guess a whole um, cadre of people who say, if you need all of those things, if you need theater to be a social justice institution, if you need theater to be social services, then you need something other than theater. And I think those people should go and, and, and go on and do what that is. But in my communities, the theater, in a lot of ways, like the, the, the spiritual community or the church is the hub, is the center of so many things, so many things that happen there, right? And that to me, and it's also an intergenerational thread. So you go to the theater when you are a child, you go to the theater when you're an elder, and there is something about the stories that are become the rituals that happen every year, but then there's also the new voices that are coming in. Uh, I am not unique in the work that I do, and um, I am, uh, more so a student and a practitioner than someone who's figured some things out. What I will say as a, as a student and a, pract and a practitioner is what we've been saying here. Um, the, the kind of, I would say the, the European constructions of the playwright and the choreographer and the dramaturg and, and all of these people um, and that you do your one thing in a silo and then you come back and you're in service of the product. Um, that doesn't seem to serve my communities well. That doesn't seem to serve um, the, the well-being of the institutions that are supporting the work, but the well-being of the people. Um, most often in my communities, you can, I, can, I can actually say, hey, I want you to come in and be a dancer. And that person is actually better at building constructions and set pieces and, and the, the ability to be able to move around and do things that are not on your resume is definitely, I would say, a dismantling of this kind of hierarchical notion of what theater is supposed to be. Well, there are folks for 50 years, there are organizations for 50 years that have been saying, you come here to heal, you come here to eat, you come here to learn, you come here to get inspired, you come here when you can't go anywhere else. And that's my default. That's my default. Theater as a place of visioning, Theater is a place of connecting. Theater is a place of remembering, of storytelling and story gathering, of responding and being, and, and most often being relevant to what the people need now. Relevant to what the people need now. I, I think, you know, um, my work in particular is, is collaborative. And so I might be the one that gets the commission, but I am not a one woman show. As soon as I get whatever the commission is, I am immediately thinking about, even maybe sometimes even before, um, because I will find a way to make the work that I am, my communities are asking me to make, regardless of if, if, if I get a commission or not. And so, but right now I'm on, a, I'm, I'm on an incline and I'm, I'm getting resources. And so what does that mean? That means there's a politics, um, a politic around who I bring into the room. Um, and, and people watch that. People watch. And it's not, there's some, there's some expectations that, oh, Ebony is a black woman, so there are going to be black woman, women in the room. Yes, you're right. But there are also going to be people who, in the room, who often don't get an opportunity to, um, you know, to be their fullest selves in their creative capacity. And I think there's something that we can all learn, and I am learning, about what it means
for a theater community to accept folks where they are and to say, while, while for at, at one moment the goal may be a show, there are all of these touch points along the way that allow you to be fully embodying yourself. And that means for me that theater is not just an artistic practice, but it's an organizing practice. It's a practice that's in relationship to what we need to amplify in the world and what we need to dismantle in the world. And am I gonna dismantle everything because I have resources to make a, make a play or make a show or make a processional? Uh, no, but every time we have the opportunity to gather to talk about what needs to change and what should change and how can we be more ourselves in the space, and there's a rigor in that. There is a definite rigor, it is hard. It is hard to hold space and say, we know there's a show that has to happen, but I actually care about how you're, how you're feeling right now. I, think it's, I don't think it's um, different from what Kimmy has to do. Like there, there are responsibilities, there are report backs and there is accountability that's involved. And how do we be more human in that process? It means that sometimes, you know, some people are not ready. They're ready to do, do the five, six, seven, eight. They're ready for the play. But what I say, as I've been saying, is we are not making a play. We're making a ceremony. And this is going to call on parts of yourself that have nothing to do with you being an artist. Uh, some folks head for the hills. This is, that's too much vulnerability. It's too much intimacy. Um, and, and actually, for me, I'm looking for vulnerability and intimacy and to how, learn how more how to be more vulnerable and intimate um, through my art making. It is a way that I can learn how to be more vulnerable and intimate in my just regular life. And so what am I saying here? I'm saying that there's, a, there's space for it all. There's space to be able to go to see a show and have a good time. You know, I, one of my best Broadway experiences was going to see Fela. I was like, oh my goodness, this is what I've wanted to see my entire life. I've never seen this in my entire life. And then there is space to say, come to Weeksville Heritage Center, where we are going to be thinking through and unpacking what sovereignty and agency and liberation looks like by remembering and remixing the, the, our legacy. Um, there's space for it all. There's space for it all. I, I am not interested in, and this is a question that I've actually been asked a lot here recently. I am not interested in battling Broadway. I'm not interested in trying to make Broadway do something. I'm interested in doing my own work. <laughs> um, I'm interested in doing the work that I have been called to do, that I've been mentored and trained to do, that I know I'm here to do. I am not here to fight Broadway no matter what's going on on Broadway, and I'm sure there's a lot that needs to change. I am not fighting Broadway. I am working in my corner with my crew, building the stories and the practices and learning how to be a better human myself um, instead of you know, a fight, a reactionary fight. And so I'll just say finally, you know, there's something about collaborating with organizations that are not theaters to make theater. And right now, because I'm in a moment, you know, where I'm able to look very deeply in two directions, a project that I'm building with theaters and a project that I'm building that is, that is with an heritage center is what the archive has to offer us. Um, Weeksville Heritage Center has such a vast archive and the approach to bringing a story to life through an archive that I would not have any access to in any other way is, and that archive is about how community is built. I am learning so much in this moment because the archivists there have taken an interest in my art project to learn, wait, 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 so how does a community actually get built from just grassland and swamp and trees? Um, that's something that I think is a, is a good way to use my time. And so that's where I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, no, that, that is good advice. We at the Siegel, of course, are closer to the experimental theater, the downtown world, the, the global theater that has no, no real space uh, in, in New York City, the melting pot that perhaps never really melted. And, um, 
but I think the, the contributions you make. But tell us a bit, maybe you're coming closer to the, the project. You say, I'm so excited about you. Tell us a bit, what are you doing at the moment? What is it? Right now, we just wrapped up our first um, phase one of devising. It was so amazing the, yesterday, I'll just say. Yesterday, okay. So tell us a bit, what are you doing? What are American artists doing at the moment? So that's important to hear. Well, I don't know what all American artists are doing, but what I am doing, You're doing is yeah. gathering mm -hmm. people from around the globe to meet on Zoom, to activate Weeks Reels Archive and build a story that is both in the tradition and the legacy of Weeks Reels, but where there is a portal that open, opens and we're able to see and tell stories and build stories that are based in a practice of building a black liberation colony. I don't have a script. I'm actually not a playwright. Yeah. Um, and so the idea is that we come together and we, we use the archive to imagine possibilities. That's what my theater is right now, imagining possibilities. And so literally for, I don't know, two or three 29 hour processes, it was like, Let's read this piece of the, the legacy. Let's re read this piece of the archive and then write a poem about it or imagine a scene about it. And we actually don't have to be in the same room to develop stories that we want to share when we can be in the same room. Um, and so what we have now is a whole a score of the entire piece and a score of all of the cultural events and community engagements that we are going to do to help activate a co contemporary conversation around reparations, mm -hmm. which is a major theme at Weeksville right now. What is reparations? How can we remember it? And how can we build it now? And so yesterday, um, we had a virtual salon, a digital liberation salon, where my, my friends from all over the place came together and we did short duets and longer conversations and a work in progress showing that's based on what we've been doing for most of the spring and into the summer. What I think artists, um, I want to, I'll give one, give one um, nugget of um, advice or an invitation, if you will, um, for artists to listen to themselves and understand that just because everyone is spiraling, you don't have to spiral. Um, just because everyone is making statements and doing the things, you don't have to. That this is a moment of, of radical breakthrough. And for me, understanding the, the chaos of that is, I'm getting through it by remembering that many of my, my community members and my elders and my ancestors have been through many ruptures and breakdowns and breakthroughs and I'm here because of them all. And so it's, it's scary, but it was scary before March, you know? <laughs> and the, so the idea, I think, it would be to listen deeply to yourself and listen deeply to the people you are accountable to and make art from that space. I know people have gigs and contracts and jobs and all of that, um, but in the midst of doing all of that, where are you? My invitation is to find and continue to be intimately connected to you individually and you, your people. Mm -hmm. so that's, that's very, very, very significant advice to, you know, listen, to find who you are and con in yourself and, and to connect to people. And I like your idea when you said earlier, no, to you do a show, but I'm interested, how do you feel? You know, that's quite, quite, a, quite a concept, quite something, sounds so simple, but something very uh, significant. And, and, and to say, to have, to say, I don't do plays or should I do ceremonies? I'm a big believer in, in, in ceremonies and um, rituals. And um, so this is some, it's the most significant contribution. So what are you guys listening to at the moment or reading? Is there something where you say, this, in this time of COVID, this has been important to me? Who's inspiring mm. you? That is, I definitely, um, speaking of Fella, there's Fella has certainly shown up on, on, the, on the Spotify list, but also listening to a lot of uh, staple singers, a lot of Aretha. Um, I played Black Pro by Beyonce about 15 times on repeat while my husband was out running. 
uh, <laughs> this weekend. Um, and uh, really trying to, it is this sense of wanting to ground myself in the things that have given me um, joy and respite since I was a child. My father, who's Nigerian, Aretha is mm -hmm. one of his favorite singers. So I've been listening to Aretha since I, probably since before I was born. Mm -hmm. So for me, she's always a touchstone and always brings me back to a sense of myself. Mm -hmm. and, and books or writers or um, ideas? Uh, is there yeah. that you suggest? Uh, yeah. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Ebony and I'll, I'll run through my, through my list okay. in my head. Okay. So music, music is the, the, the main thing for me right now. Yeah. Right now, I am listening to a lot of... Uh, experimental and spiritual jazz, um, definitely like um, Coltrane, Alice Coltrane, Thelonious Monk, Charles Mingus. Like I'm, I'm in the jazz. It jazz opens up my brain, opens up my mm -hmm. my sight, <laughs> my inner sight. I'm also listening to a lot of like '70s funk. Um, so you can you can often find me listening to Earth, Wind, and Fire. Um, I'm, I'm really here for the 70s funk music. Um, I am reading a lot of archival, a lot of archival mm -hmm. work. I'm reading um, a lot of work by Dr. Alexis Pauline Gums, um, mm -hmm. who's um, a, a big inspiration for me and a friend. Um, I'm reading, and I'm always rereading this, Experiments in the Jazz Aesthetic um, by Dr. Joni um, uh, Omi Oshun, Joni L. Jones, and Sharon Bridgeforth, um, um, because their that work is it reminds me of what theater in the tradition that I am leaning into is about. Um, this book, uh, the, this book I, I talked about yesterday as well, Workings of the Spirit by Houston A. Baker. It's a book that's about African American women writers and again in that idea of the literary ceremony and how poetry and narrative and essay and, and, and um, writing for the stage as well is a part of a tradition and a continuum of bringing forth the reality that you want to live in. Yeah, um, all of that definitely like I said earlier the music has played a really big part. I've been reading a lot about um, and listening, uh, podcasts, et cetera, um, doing a lot of deep thinking around kind of reparations, um, the Black uh, Radical Imagination by Dr. Kelly, Freedom Dreams, um, The Yellow House by Sarah Broom, thinking about issues, again, the sense of groundedness and, and uh, how to situate ourselves in space. Um, one of the books that I'm very excited to read and just uh, ordered is about Lift Every Voice and Sing by Imani Perry, which is um, the, known as the Black American uh, uh, Anthem, National Anthem. And it was something that I was introduced to in my teens when I went to Florida a &M University, a historically Black college. And it's a song that it means a lot to me and being able to kind of dive into that from a historical perspective. Um, as well as many other uh, perspectives mm -hmm. that Dr. Henry, uh, Dr. Um, Perry offers is something I'm very much excited about. I've been looking at a lot of art and reminding myself about what, what I love about uh, Carrie Mae Weems and Lorna Simpson and Glenn Ligon, as well as all the incredible um, LP artists that I get to be uh, connected with and learn from. Some of my deepest learnings by far um, happens from laundromat project artists and what they care about, what they push me to pay attention to or to think about or to see um, in a way that uh, might be different than I might have seen it for myself. Um, so that's, I, I have tried to approach this moment, which none of us asked for, but here we are given um, as a gift, as a portal, as Aradasi Roy um, offered to us. Um, into um, a, a, a time of incredibly deep listening and thinking and um, reorienting. Um, uh, but 
just listening and looking and thinking and, and listening again. Like it just co keeps coming back to this idea of uh, being grounded in listening with my eyes and my ears and my tactility, like listening as a full body experience. Mm. And what advice, let's say for a young artist, someone who comes to the LP and maybe doesn't get the project right in or Ebony, someone comes to you and uh, is starting out. What advice do you have to, to artists for the moment now? Maybe also for our viewers, you know, how to deal with the moment. But what advice, what do you give to someone seriously who's, who might be struggling and making sense, creating meaning out of this, at least in our lifetime, unprecedented situation? Hmm. Confusion. Ah, oh, yes, Kim. No, pl no, please, Ebony. Um, in this moment, there is space for confusion. In this moment, there is space to not know what to do. Um, Kimmy spoke about grace earlier. Grace is hard. It is. Yeah. It's challenging. It's challenging. There's so much at stake and there's so much that's important, but grace is, I think, Super critical. So, and I'll I'll make it I'll make it brief. I know we're we're getting to time or past time, um, but what I will say is that you, if you if you if you're trying and you make a mistake, right? Accept that you are learning. Accept that you're in process, and accept that other people may not accept your mistake, right? Um, but be very comfortable with discomfort. Be very comfortable with moving beyond your growing edges, as, as we, we talk about often. And what's outside of that is everything. And so my advice is to gracefully fail and ask questions and, um, and stop and listen, um, respond, not react, and as long as we are here, we are in this experiment called life. I echo all of that 100%. And uh, yeah, that idea of, of self-grace um, is so important. And I would say um, some of what I offer young folks, and I talk to them often, and just today someone emailed, um, is to listen to what to themselves about what helps them thrive and lean into that. Because that's something I think some of us suffer for longer than we need to by trying to make ourselves fit in where it doesn't make sense for us and being able to um, lean into creation and to create the life that we want is a real, is an actual option. And I think some of us just need permission to hear that that's okay. And people told me that early um, and, and late. Some, some lessons happened quicker than other lessons. Um, so that feels important. And to continue to make me and those of my generation and other generations uncomfortable. Um, and to let us learn from them as well, I think is incredibly important. And I think we are living that in this moment in a really profound and visible way. Uh, we, a lot of the... Uh, movements and the letters and the uh, you know uprisings in the streets etc are being led by young people who are telling us that they do not want to inherit what we are offering um, and it is our duty to listen and to learn and to be in conversation um, there are some things that do deserve uh, uh, to, to see another day perhaps but that's going to happen in conversation with them about what those things are that we want to save from the world that used to be and take with us into the world that's coming. And, and they don't have to accept what, what we, have, we think that is. And I'm thrilled and frightened and uncomfortable and scared and back to thrilled and inspired and moved by what they have to teach us. So I definitely think of it as a, a polyphonic moment uh, with many voices in many different directions and being able to kind of hold the space for that as um, someone who's been in this field for, you know, a long time, I think is one of the most important things uh, we can do is to create the space 
for uh, particularly for younger voices to show us what the way is forward. Yeah, it's significant and important. The both of you said, and it, I will go back and then listen to it again. But this is um, this is very, very, very valuable advice, and for all of our listeners, the whole body of work is behind what both of them just said through their actions and their results. So it's something very, very significant that to, to be taken very serious. Really, both of you, thank you. Thank you for taking the time. You went a bit over, over our time, but you know, Melanie Joseph, who said, Frank, you have to talk to Kami and Ebony, you have. So Melanie Joseph, I'm the founder and she's right, you know, and your, your contribution to the city is what makes the city, the city. And if people ask like this magazine, the Spiegel, what is the soul? of New York City, uh, will it come back? I don't know, it's always been there. And it's people like you and through your work who, who, who make a city a city. Because as you said, it's not just the building, they're concrete and there's yes. stones, but the people inside. And, and so really congratulations on your work. And there's a lot, a lot to learn and to take that very, very serious, how you approach art and community and what you create as a way of saying this, if you do it also in your own life, in your own building, in your own neighborhood, it's what you learn through art, mm -hmm. this will save you, this will change you, this will make it a better world, or as you said uh, earlier on, that uh, uh, shifting the world towards a better place. And art has always been doing that. Artists have been on the right side. In the complex struggle for history and the history of freedom and liberties, they have been on the right side of social progress and they are also now and we really need to listen listen to them so thank you both of you really from the bottom of my heart and for, yeah for our listeners thank you for the tomorrow invitation. thank you no really i know how busy both of you are and uh, that may means a lot to me that you made this happen and um, tomorrow we're going to hear from kosovo where the national theater of kosovo mm -hmm. has been destroyed three four weeks ago because mm -hmm. of real estate ideas so jason mm -hmm. Netsurai will will talk about this. He came here with this one of his LGBT plays uh, to La Mama, where he went through villages, small little towns, and had discussions. He's been trying to change um, his country. He's going to come with uh, Giannina Carabunario. See, once he suggested to come, he said, "I want to come with her." So it's interesting. He invited someone from Romania, and she will talk about her situation. And there, Wednesday, we have Frederic Aid. Tuati from France, from France, who will uh, talk about her work, about environment, about Brecht, about radical listening, and also lifelong learning and engagement and what theater can do. Um, she works with Bruno Latour, the, the philosopher. Um, Iman Aoun from Palestine, who runs the Ashta Theater in the Palestine uh, territories. Mm -hmm. um, um, and he will tell about how incredibly hard it is already to do work there, building communities, what she does, but what does it do mean now in the time of COVID um, to, be, uh, um, to be there? And uh, then we have two artists from Jamaica, English speaking, Caribbean, we mostly had also French speaking, but we have uh, Sakina Deer and Ivone uh, Walters from Jamaica who will tell us uh, an update, what it means for them, uh, the reality of COVID, how to create theater, what they do for their community, what the community wants for them, and also, what can we learn? What can we learn from places like them? Like we learned so much when we had the talk with Rwanda, um, you know, then because these people also didn't have space, didn't have money, didn't have support, all that would be experiencing, but they created something that worked. And, um, and so as you guys are doing something that is significant, important, and that works, and it will be even more important because it's a model for something that will come in anticipation of the future. So thank you really, really again. That uh, means a lot to me and, uh, and uh, to hear you and for engaging. And thanks to HowlRound for hosting us, uh, Vijay and Sia and Travis, and um, to the Siegel team, Andy and Sun Yang, and to our audience really for taking the time to listen. It's important that we listen to Ebony and Kemi and their experiences. And it's also really meaningful to our lives if we really adapt it because it's all about you, who is the spectator, the community member, because this is ultimately where change comes from and then some actions that come out of it. So, um, and we learn through the experience of the artists like the ones we have um, today. So it's a great compliment to have uh, you with us and here and I hope everybody will stay safe and stay tuned in, wear a mask, it is important. And um, yeah. 
and I hope you all will uh, save, uh, be with us tomorrow. And New York City is a really, really great, great city. It's a dangerous moment. It's a tough moment. It might take <laughs> years or a decade to rebuild, but it's been through a lot, but it will be a better place um, because of the people who are inside, um, it's like the guys like you. So thank you all and uh, uh, see you soon. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Really, really thank you.